Hello everyone, Lieutenant Duckweed here. This video is intended as a companion to the amazing video on Strats and Blitz's channel of our SSTO mission to Jules Zero Altitude and back. So if you haven't watched that, I definitely recommend you go check it out by following the link in the description. Now, the purpose of this video is to go into a bit more depth on the design iterations and the challenges that led to a fully functional Joule SSTO, starting from zero knowledge of atmospheric flight on Joule and culminating in the craft featured in the final mission. So this is Joule Diver 1, which was my very first attempt at aerodynamic flight on Joule. It was primarily designed to test the heating effects on Joule. However, it was not very effective at that because the extremely high wing area meant that it almost immediately skipped back out of the atmosphere upon entry. This was quickly rectified with Joule Diver 2. So the main difference between Joule Diver 1 and Joule Diver 2 is that Joule Diver 2 has decreased wing area by about a factor of 7 so that we can fly at a lower altitude in the atmosphere for a given airspeed, more thoroughly testing the aerodynamic heating, which as it turns out is not much of an issue due to the fact that Mach number and shock heating are tied to each other. And because the speed of sound on Joule is three times higher than it is on Kerbin, due to the very light hydrogen helium atmosphere, even though orbital velocity is about six kilometers per second, that's only about Mach 7. Now, Joule Diver 3 and Joule Diver 4 are simply iterations upon Joule Diver 2, adding more fuel tanks to explore the upper bounds of allowable delta V while still maintaining a high thrust to weight ratio. Joule Diver 5 is where it first starts to get interesting. As you can see, we have two prop fans in this utility bay, each of which has eight blades, plenty of RTGs to power the prop fans, and additional fuel and wing area. Unfortunately for Joule Diver 5, 16 blades is nowhere near enough to power an ascent up to the high altitudes necessary to get good ISP on the nukes, and so it was ultimately relegated to a one-way trip. Joule Diver 6 and 7 are twins in a way. They have the same number of parts, they have the same kind of parts, they differ only in the exact placement of the wings. Now you'll see that uh, there's some big differences between this and Joule Diver 5. First off, we have vastly increased vertical stabilizer to increase yaw stability, and we have vastly increased wing area as well as doubling the number of prop blades. However, I found that this was still not quite enough blade, so while it could get higher, it was not able to quite make that last push to orbit. And here we have the aptly named Joule SSTO, also sometimes known as Joule Diver 8. Now, the biggest differences between this and Joule Diver 6 and 7 is the improved wing placement and 50% more fan blades for a total of 48. Now, it's still just powered by two medium rotors and 16 RTGs, but those extra blades give it just enough oomph that it can get a high enough altitude for the nukes to take over, push past supersonic, and on all the way to orbit. Now, this is the first ever successful Joule SSTO. So, as soon as I made it to orbit with Joule SSTO, I started thinking about ways to improve it, and that quickly led to Joule SSTO 3. Now, the main improvements here are that I took the two and a half tons of spare liquid fuel I had left over, and I instead replaced those with ion engines, batteries, and ion fuel, as well as replacing a little bit extra liquid fuel with the intention being to co-burn the ions all the way up to orbit using the electricity generated by the nukes. Unfortunately, I overdid it a little bit, and it no longer had enough delta V to be able to reach orbit all in one go, as a result was condemned to a fiery death. Now, there are more improvements that could be made. We can, for example, replace the big S wings with big S strakes, which hold more fuel per mass. And we can replace the liquid fuel tanks, which are Mark 1s, with Mark 0s. While much smaller, they have a better wet-dry ratio of 11 to 1 rather than the 9 to 1 the Mark 1s have. About this time, Strats and Blitz contacted me about potentially doing a collab project, and of course the mission we settled on was to do a single stage from Kerbin sea level to Joule sea level and safely back again. Now, to make this work, we knew we were going to need every possible efficiency trick in the book, and so we decided to do a from scratch design, starting with a 1.25 meter 
instead of a 2.5 meter form factor as this allowed us to save both mass and drag. So you'll see that we have a 1.25 meter fairing, a 1.25 meter payload bay, which is still surprisingly able to shield the fans from drag, and then seven nuclear engines at the back, which are able to produce thrust and yet are still shielded from drag by the fairing. Additionally, there is one ion engine tucked away underneath the fairing. As we decided to do this build in stages, this is just the engines, the power for the engines, and the ISRU unit, which you'll also see tucked there under the fairing. The next step, of course, was to add the wings and the fuel tanks. This new version of the craft has about 70 wing strakes and 200 Mark Zero tanks. Unfortunately, it is also nowhere near stable on Jewel, and one of our planned landing sites, the waters on Lathe, resulted in the craft not being able to take off again. So we were going to have to get creative. And get creative we did. You'll see here we added little water winglets under the front end of the craft. Now the nukes can help the craft get up to a decent speed in the water, but unless it can get out of the water, the props will never generate any significant thrust. So having those little water winglets, coupled with the fact that the back wings of the craft are much lower than the front wings, the whole craft will slowly rise out of the water, allowing the props to generate more thrust and hoist the whole craft into the air. At this point, the craft was almost ready for prime time, but there were a few small tweaks for quality of life that we decided to go ahead and make. First off, we increased the vertical stabilizing area, which also gave us the ability to balance on the strakes to do vertical takeoffs and landings on Kerbin. In addition, we upgraded to two Kerbals and gave them positively luxurious accommodations in the form of a Mark I command pod and an inflatable airlock. Lastly, we went ahead and upgraded to two ion engines, added some extra ion fuel, and just a touch of battery capacity just to make those ion transfers a little less painful. With that, the craft was finally ready to begin the mission. So, now that we've covered the full evolution of the craft all the way up to the final craft that ran the mission, let's look at what's similar, what's different, what was improved, and what's worse between the first Jewel SSTO and the one that ran the mission. So right off the bat, we saved a lot of dry mass and drag by going to a smaller form factor, which was primarily enabled by discovering that we could still shield the blades from drag while putting them in that smaller 1.25 meter payload bay. In addition, we've gone from the Big S wings to the more efficient Big S strakes, as well as going from Mark I tanks to Mark Zero tanks. Now, one of the biggest savings, which has not actually been mentioned up to this point, on the original craft, the props are very far forward, whereas on the new craft, they are very far back. What this means is that the props on the newer craft actually increase stability as they become draggier and draggier with speed whereas on the old craft they actually cause instability, which means that on the old craft we had to shut them down at about 440 meters per second, whereas on the new craft, even though their top speed on props alone is only about 489 meters per second, they actually can assist the nukes all the way up to about 800 meters per second, which saves us about two to 300 meters per second of delta V in addition, we have some ion engines in the new craft, which help push us to orbit and then perform all orbital maneuvers once we've made it back to Joule orbit, uh, as well as assisting in the initial transfer from Pole to Joule, which was our first refueling location of the mission. One place that we have regressed is actually the heavier accommodations for the crew. So we had some weird issues with very small fairings and crew chairs, um, resulting in catastrophic disassembly of the craft and thereby forcing us to go with the heavier, draggier parts. However, compared to the massive efficiency gains elsewhere in the design, those were ultimately inconsequential. So one of the more interesting aspects of these two designs is the ways in which they're similar. So the number of prop blades and the total wing area of the craft are actually identical, while the thrust to weight ratios, the total amount of liquid fuel carried, and the total mass of the craft are all within 5% of each other. So these values at least were fairly close to optimal. The biggest efficiency gains came from the reduction in drag from the smaller form factor, the reduction in dry mass from more efficient parts, and especially the ability to co-use the prop blades all the way up to 800 meters per second, 
and the co-burning of the ion engines all the way from the initial start of the burn to orbit. So to wrap things up, I just want to go ahead and say this mission was an absolute blast to run. I thoroughly enjoyed it. We really pushed the limits of what's possible in stock KSP. Um, this is my first edited voiceover, so let me know what you think. Thanks for watching.